This is going to be a quick study about drinking. What does the Bible say about drinking? One of the first things people ask me about when they find out I'm a Christian is, do I drink? Do I think it's okay to drink? Do I think they're sinning if they drink? And I think it's many times because they already have a guilty conscience about it. Many people say it's okay to drink as long as you don't get drunk. You know, they say things like that. But is that true according to the Bible? Look at Proverbs 23 and verse 29. This is one of the strongest parts of the Bible against drinking alcohol. It says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? So one of the first things we see about it is it brings woe and sorrow not the joy and happiness that is portrayed on the commercials and the billboards and by people who try to get you to drink. You see, it's always portrayed in a very positive light, like it tastes good and it looks good on the commercials. They make it, it like after you see the commercial, you'll be thirsty. They make it look good. They make it seem like you're going to get all the girls but all the drunks that I've known in my life didn't get any girls. They didn't have uh, joy and happiness. They had woe and sorrow. I mean, what's fun about drinking so much that you puke? That sounds like woe and sorrow, not joy and happiness. What's so fun about a hangover? Is it fun to have a headache? What's so fun about losing your job because you're so tired from drinking the, the previous day that you don't get up and go to work or what's so fun about a busted marriage what's so fun about domestic violence that's caused by drinking i know people personally in my family that had had domestic violence problems because the man was drinking sounds like woe and sorrow and not joy and happiness but look at that next word, contentions. Who hath contentions? There are people who get drunk, get angry, and start unnecessary fights and arguments. Uh, as When I was a teenager, I saw a drunk, grown man, probably in his 40s, try to start a fight with a nine-year-old kid. I mean, somebody in their right mind who hasn't lost their judgment Hopefully he's not going to start a fight with a nine-year-old kid. Who hath contentions? Somebody that drinks. Look at that next word, babbling. Who hath babbling? My dad would get drunk and call me, and I would have absolutely no idea what he was saying. He sounded like an idiot. It was embarrassing to listen to. Uh, we went to a pizza place one time. We were the only ones in there. He said the place was packed. And he was in there uh, babbling to the employees. It was disgusting. Nobody, nobody thought it was funny. Nobody was laughing. I wasn't laughing. Uh, he, he was out of it. it. That's what drinking does to you. It's not funny like they portray it on TV. Uh, everybody thinks that you look stupid unless they're drinking too. And then that next one. Wounds without cause. Who hath wounds without cause? This is because you get drunk. You can get into fights because you're contentious. And you wake up the next morning and don't even know how you got the black eye. You don't even know how you fell and got bruises all over you. Because you're falling all over the place because you're drunk. You can't even walk straight. Who hath redness of eyes? I remember my dad being so drunk... I told him to look at his eyes and the visor, the mirror and the visor in the car. And he couldn't even get the visor down. Who hath redness of eyes? Proverbs twenty three thirty. They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. Notice that they're seeking it. They seek mixed wine. They're seeking the wrong thing. The Bible tells you what to seek. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, according to Matthew six thirty three. If you'll seek God, seek peace, then you're going to find happiness through God, 
not through the things of this world. And actually, if you're seeking, just straight up seeking happiness, you're not going to find it. Seek God first, and happiness will come right along. And it's not going to involve drinking. Drinking does not fix problems in life. It causes more problems. Let's see what David was seeking. In Psalm 63, 1, it says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh no longer, or my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. So David was thirsting after God, not alcohol. Now, Proverbs 23, 31, you've heard somebody say, I don't touch this stuff, which that's good. But here's something even better. It says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. So don't look on the wine when it's red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Don't look upon the stuff. If somebody offers you alcohol, say, I don't even look on the stuff. Take it a step further than I don't even touch the stuff, so I don't even look at it. Because it could tempt you. A lot of people are tempted just by looking at the pictures. Or by seeing it poured in a glass. You know how they try to tempt you by pouring it into the glass or something like that. I can see, you know, someone who was an alcoholic before, when they see that poured in the glass, I bet they're extremely tempted to commit that sin of drinking. Proverbs twenty three thirty two. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Those are strong words considering the devil is a serpent. Referred to as a serpent. See, you, you see, it. alcohol is a hedge breaker. Ecclesiastes 10.8 says, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. So you see that? It biteth like a serpent, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Alcohol is a hedge breaker. If you're a Christian and you're drinking, you just... Breaking the hedge. The devil's getting closer and closer to attacking you. No, you can't lose your salvation, but you can be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And that's what drinking will do to you. What's another thing about drinking? Sexual immorality. Proverbs twenty-three thirty-three: Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Alcohol is connected with sexual immorality in the Bible. Uh, and one of the first stories, Genesis chapter 9, 20 through 24. Someone very unexpected gets drunk. It says, And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and was drunk, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brethren without, and Shem and Japheth, took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered their father's nakedness, the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. So Ham saw the nakedness of his father and did something to his father sexually immoral while his father was drunk. And because of this, Noah knew what his younger son had done to him, and, it, and he gets a curse placed on his sons. It says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. So Ham's line is cursed. He didn't put the curse on him. He put the curse on Ham's line that they should be servant of servants. All because that sexual immoral act that took place between Ham and Noah because Noah got drunk. Many people say that was the first case of homosexuality because someone had been drinking. You know good and well that would never happen if Noah had never drunk. Genesis 19 is another one. Genesis 19:32 through 36. This is Lot and his two daughters after Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is after the Lord has delivered them 
from that horrible place. Look what happens. In Genesis 19.32, it says, Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night. And the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he perceived not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesternight with my father. Let us make him drink wine this night also, and go thou in and lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he perceived not when she lay down nor when she arose. Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. So you see, the daughters knew that if they could get Lot drunk, that he would go as far and, and be so perverse that he would be able to have sex with his own daughters. So see, alcohol was connected with homosexuality. It's connected with incest. Connected with sexually immoral things in the Bible. And this led to two children being born where you get the Ammonites and the Moabites. Enemies of God's people came from this sexually immoral event that took place here. And then in Second Samuel, here you have David who sees Bathsheba bathing and he lusts after Bathsheba, a married woman. And he, he's so overcome with lust for her that he takes her. He commits adultery with her. She, he finds out that she's pregnant. And immediately he's freaking out because he wants to cover his sin. And he wants everyone to believe that, that's her, that the child belongs to her husband. So what he's going to do is he's, he gets her husband, Uriah. And he wants to get Uriah drunk so that he can make sure that he'll go home and have sex with his wife. You see, that wouldn't have been bad for him to go home and have sex with his wife. I mean, it's his wife. But it just shows that there's a connection between someone drinking and someone being more easily to have sex when they do that. Second Samuel eleven twelve through 13 says, And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David ca had him ca had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. So you know the story. Uriah didn't do what David wanted him to do, and David has him murdered. But you see there how... You see what David was trying to do in the association with alcohol and sex. You see it like that throughout the Bible. And in, in, in Habakkuk 2.15, it says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So the Bible plainly says, when someone tries to get you to drink, they're trying to look on your nakedness. Alcohol is associated with sexual things throughout the Bible. Why does a boy try to get a young girl to drink? Because she loses all of her morals, all of her judgment, and he can easily sleep with her. Proverbs 23, 34 through 35 says, Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea. You're tossed to and fro if you're a a drunk, he's confused, he's tossed to and fro. Or is he that lieth upon the top of a mast? They have stricken me, thou shalt say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. That's the true words for an alcoholic and an, any, a drug addict of any kind. Even though it's killing them. It's destroying their family. Their kids don't have food. They're stealing from their own parents. Yet, what do they say? When I awake, I'll seek it yet again. It's a, a never-ending cycle until they get right with God and get some help. That way, from God. It's, it's going to take more than rehab for most people. It's going to take more than, than support from someone. 
It's going to take God himself to get you away from this addiction of drugs or alcohol. You're just going to seek it again. And that's what they do. When shall I wake? I will seek it yet again. Now, I'm going to show you some verses that people are going to use to try to teach you that drinking alcohol is okay. Primarily, that drinking alcohol is okay as long as you don't get drunk. And I'm always weary of people that are always trying to get me to drink with them. Because that verse said, Woe unto him. In Habakkuk 2.15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Why do people want to get me to drink so badly? I've always thought that was strange. And, you know, these are people that don't care about the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't care about the Bible. They don't care about anything but fulfilling the desires of their flesh. Yet, when it comes to drinking, they know all kinds of Bible verses. They can quote me all types of Bible verses. That's the only subject they know about. And here's some verses that they have when they're trying to get you to drink, trying to get you to go out with them one night and drink. In Ephesians 5.18, it says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, how do they make this a verse that makes it look like you can drink? It says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. So they say, Well, see, it's okay to drink as long as you don't do it in excess. But you see, it doesn't say, Don't drink wine excessively. It says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. You see, the excess is in the wine itself. If you look at 1 Peter 4.4, 4, you'll see that word excess again. And it says, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. You see, it's never good to riot. You see, the excess is in the riot itself, not you know, it's not okay to riot a little bit. So you see, the excess is in the riot itself, just like the excess is in the wine. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Then another one in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8. It says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy, greedy of filthy looks. So, not given to much one, so they'll say, we well, see, well, you can drink as long as you don't drink too much. And that's that's crazy because in First Timothy three three it says not given to wine. So compare scripture with scripture here. Obviously, if you're not given to wine, you're not going to be given to much wine. The Paul is teaching complete abstinence from drinking, not given to wine. Then in uh, the same book of the Bible, 1 Timothy 5.23, here's one of the big ones they use. It, Paul tells Timothy, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So they say here, you're even, Paul even says for us to drink. But that's, that's not what's going on here. He just got done telling Timothy not to be given to wine. And this, if the, you see, there's two kinds of wine in the Bible, which we're about to get into. And, you know, this is referring to medicine. It's not referring to, you know, just social drinking and just saying, well, hey, I'm going to drink a, a glass of this wine every day to make me feel better. This is referring to a medicine. I mean, something like what we'd have today, like NyQuil or something like that. But I'm going to show you there's two kinds of wine in the Bible. Every time the Bible says wine, it doesn't mean alcoholic wine. It can mean something else. In Isaiah 65, 8, it says, Thus said the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. So you see, new wine is found in the cluster. Like a cluster of grapes. It's just grape juice. Proverbs 3, 10, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. When it bursts out of the presses, it can't be fermented alcohol. 
it's just grape juice. The new wine is grape juice. Then Matthew eleven eighteen through 19, you have where they accuse, it, it's a, talking about Jesus' accusers. It says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he hath the devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Notice it says, And they say, it's about what people say. It was about his accusers. You know, you have all these country singers. Thomas Rhett, for example, says, If I could have a beer with Jesus. Miranda Lambert says, I heard Jesus, he drank wine. Uh, all these people constantly accusing Jesus of being some type of drunk. You know, they're acting like they're acting like his enemies. They're acting like the people that crucify him, his accusers. They say... Behold a man gluttonous in a wine bibber. So you see, all these people are just so set out to justify their sin that they're going to bring the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible into that to use those things to justify their wickedness. It's like, why are you drinking? Are you drinking because you thought Jesus drank? If that's why, then why aren't you doing all the other good things that Jesus did? Jesus preached on the street. Do you preach on the street? Jesus had compassion on people. Where's your compassion? Where's your compassion on people when you're getting in a car after drinking and you're driving drunk and uh, got your Black Lives Matter stuff on when you don't? nobody's life really matters to you because you're driving drunk? If you're driving drunk, the only life that matters is yours and really yours don't even matter then because you're putting your own self in danger people are are hypocrites when it comes to these things isaiah nineteen fourteen gives you a good picture of how god feels about alcohol it says the lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof and they have caused egypt to err in every work thereof as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit God describes alcohol as a very filthy thing in the Bible. Isaiah 28, 7 through 8. But they have also, they also have erred through wine and through strong drink. Or out of the way, the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. God sees alcohol as a nasty, filthy thing. And I, I remember as a kid, uh, my, my stepbrother lived in an apartment beside my mom's house. He would come over, he would steal my stuff. So when he, I'd wait till he left, and then I would break into his apartment, which I shouldn't have done. I mean, I wasn't saved in or anything. But I'd break in there, and I'd steal my stuff back. There would be beer cans all over the place there would be puke on the table there would be puke in the bathroom there'd be puke leading up to the bathroom I mean, it's a it's a very very filthy sin is what alcohol is it says for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness i remember as a kid not knowing anything about the bible then when i got older and i read verses like this i'm like that's so true the bible's so true Proverbs 20 and verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. How are people deceived by alcohol? They're deceived when they say, a little bit won't hurt. Or, it's okay to drink as long as you don't get drunk. I've heard people say, I know how much I can handle. Okay, how do you know how much you can handle unless you get drunk in the first place? If you've never been drunk, then how do you know that next sip or that next bottle is not going to make you drunk? That makes no sense. Proverbs 23, 21. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Why does the drunkard come to poverty? Well, from my experience of training people at work, when someone comes in that's a drunk, they're lazy and sissy most times. Not 100% of the time. I mean, I've, I've seen some good working drunks. But for the most part, most part, 
They are lazy. All they do is sweat. And they just, they won't work. They're drowsy. They've got a headache or something. They've been drinking. They've stayed up all night drinking. And they're not worth two cents at work. And the drunkard and glutton shall come to poverty. Drowsiness shall clothe the man with the rags. They go and spend their whole paycheck on alcohol. Like some type of an idiot. Proverbs 31, 4 and 5. Said it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So you see, drinking makes you forget the law. It'll make you forget what you read in the Bible. If you're a Christian and you drink, and you get drunk, you're going to forget every good thing you've learned from the Bible. It's going to make you do things that you normally would not do. And then, Jeremiah 48, 26, another verse showing how drunkenness and vomit are associated. I don't want to do something that's so much associated with puking. I mean, how is it fun to puke? I've heard people say, man, we had so much fun Friday night. We got so drunk, we just, we puked everywhere, I'm thinking. You lost me with the puking. I already thought it was stupid, but then you really lost me with the puking. I don't like to puke. I will do all I can to avoid puking. But yet you knowingly drink that much, knowing it's going to cause you to puke. It's, it's so stupid. I mean, this has just been a short study to show you a few verses in the Bible that's against drinking alcohol. And after this, if you still think it's okay to drink alcohol, you are not a Bible believer because it's very, very clear from the Bible that you need to stay away from it. It's of the devil. Listen, drinking alcohol is of the devil. And you're going to be in serious trouble in your life for drinking alcohol. So I hope that that you can can for, can confess your for, your sin of that and forsake it. You know, just because you've drunk alcohol that doesn't mean you can't have forgiveness. That doesn't mean that you, if you're not saved it doesn't mean you can't be saved. That's what somebody so if somebody asked me one time, they said is it a sin to drink alcohol and I said, "Yeah, the Bible says it is." So he's he's like so does that mean I can't go to heaven? See, they, they don't know nothing. It doesn't mean you can't go to heaven. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Alcohol is one of those sins that he died for, is you drinking alcohol. You can be saved. Jesus Christ will forgive you of all the times you drank and got drunk. And if you're saved and you've still been drinking, all you got to do is confess your sins. And if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then you just want to get rid of that sin and start living for God the best you can. Sure, you may mess up. It may not be easy. You just keep trying, keep confessing your sins, and keep trying to forsake your sins, doing the best that you can. But just don't justify the sin by saying Jesus did it. I think that's taking it to... I think there's a difference between someone who's struggling with alcohol and someone who drinks alcohol every day and then justifies it, saying the Lord Jesus Christ drank. Because when you say that, you're, you're, it's blasphemy. Because if Jesus drank, then he was a sinner, just like me and you. And he would not have resurrected and what he did on the cross would have done nothing because he had to be sinless for the cross to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ was the sinless. He's the sinless son of God, and he died on the cross for our sins. If he drank, then he wasn't the sinless son of God. He's actually a sinner just like me and you if he did that. And if he turned the water into alcoholic wine, then he broke the law. So you can't go around saying stuff like that just because you want to go out and have a good time. I think there'll be serious consequences for that if you don't get that th thing confessed up and get it under the blood. 
But this just have been a quick study on alcohol.